Hi, everyone in our PFLAG family. Um, I'm Lorena Soto, the current president of PFLAG El Paso. And I wanted to do this um, interview with uh, Adri Perez, and I'll have them introduce themselves in a second. Uh, basically, because of what's going on in Texas and the Texas Senate around the transgender youth in sports. Um, I felt it was important for us to have this conversation. Um, I'm seeing it in social media. And I know that there is a lot of fear in the hearts of our community of parents of trans youth children and trans youth children themselves. So I'm gonna let Adri introduce themselves and then I'll go ahead and ask some questions so we're better informed. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Adri Perez. I am a transgender Texan and a lifelong El Pasoan and Fronterizo. Uh, I am 28 years old and have been transitioning for seven of those years, basically, and have been out as transgender for over a decade. Um, and I also professionally work for the ACLU of Texas as a policy and advocacy strategist. So basically it's my job to know everything that's happening in the Texas legislature and I am available for any and all questions and hopefully to ease any panic or fears that you might have. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for taking time out of your day. I really appreciate it. So I think the first thing I want to ask you just to get a better idea of, of you is to ask you, when was it that you realized that you were transgender? You know, I've, I spent the last week uh, really thinking, really thinking about my own story and when it was that I knew, uh, hearing all these parents talk, hearing all of the children talk, hearing about the legislation that they're trying to pass. Um, I knew that I was trans when I was four years old and I knew it every moment that gender ever came into question after that, right? Every moment where some where you, you saw like the girls and the boys like pick, um, I knew that I was transgender and that I didn't necessarily fit into any box. I'm, I'm non-binary, I use they, them pronouns. And that's, you know, that's harder to explain to people. And so I don't go to the into the Texas legislature saying that I'm non-binary and I knew my whole life, but I did in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, so I was four years old and I don't, and I said this to a representative also on the floor of, of the house um, in the committee and cause she was sharing a story and she was like, you know, when I came out as bisexual, they, they told me that it was a phase. Would you say that it was a phase? And then I, I looked at my watch cause I'm just sarcastic like that. And I was like, uh, if it was a phase, it, it it's a pretty long phase for a quarter of a century. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, and you know, and that, that's why, you know, I think it's important for people to know, understand that. Um, it's, I think especially parents sometimes, a lot of times uh, transgender people and, you know, queer people in different spaces in their coming out, people need to understand just because we start to tell you doesn't mean that's the first time we knew, right? I think, I think that's important. Sometimes I, I do hear parents talk about same thing. What if it's a phase, right? What if, what if it's just a phase you're going through? And I think it's important to know just cause I, you know, somebody finally found the voice to express who they are. Doesn't mean they just figured it out. Absolutely. Um, when I came out as transgender, I think it was a, it was a time and I want to share this as well. It was a time where doctors were making you say that you were um, firmly a man. So I had to go into a doctor's office and say, I am a man and I never want to have kids in order to be able to start a medical transition. And that is incredibly limiting. Um, now I have a doctor that is willing to work with me if I ever want to have children, right? Um, so things have changed and things have progressed. Um, but if I, if I say that I, if I were to identify any point in my life that was a phase, it was that one. And it wasn't even because of me, right? It was because of the system that I was forced to, to work within on my own gender discovery journey. But we're all on our own gender journeys, right? And they, they transform and they evolve and they grow and they change. And that is just a natural part of life. It doesn't mean that I am not trans, right? Because one day I feel more femme than masculine. One day I feel more masked than femme, or one day I just don't want to be in any box at all, and I just want to be Adri. Yeah, 
that's beautiful. And I think the more space we make as a society for people to be themselves, the more us as a society will benefit from who people naturally really are themselves, instead of trying to force them into one of those silly little boxes that we do. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I was thinking about this week that I want to add is I was I was really reflecting on what a difference it would have made if I had a parent or a family that supported me at age four. And it, it, quite frankly, and I said this also, it would have saved me a lot of pain and confusion to just have an adult in my life that was willing to listen. So one, being PFLAG and everything that you learn to have done and the parents and the families that oftentimes support me as well, right, as an El Paso and who was rejected by their family. Like that is so important. And it was just beautiful to watch parents all the whole week I was there in Austin share their stories and their love and their support for their kids. Yeah, no, I, that that is what I love about this PFLAG space. Um, you know, my, my mom also isn't the most supportive, um, but it's okay. Cause I got about six completely supportive parents in a PFLAG, so. It is, it is nice to be there for each other as a community. So, it, and it's important. Yeah. And so we're talking about this uh, youth sports bill, right? What are some of the misconceptions that people have around uh, trans kids and youth in sports? You know, I, I wanna start by saying that this bill is, is is a so-called solution to a problem that does not exist in Texas. Um, we do not have, we don't have a lot of transgender athletes in Texas, quite frankly, because our UIL policy is already one of the most restrictive in the country. And it designates that um, athletes are only allowed to participate in sports by the sex that is on their birth certificate. Um, we know that we can amend birth certificates, right? But that is often a costly, timely uh, procedure. And when you're talking about kids who are in middle school sports or in high school sports, right? The time that it takes to go through that process often takes longer than the time that they're in school. And so that's one thing, right? This bill is in search of a problem that does not exist. We already don't have a lot of transgender athletes in the state of Texas because we're already banning them from participating in sports. Um, so that's one thing. Secondly, there's this misconception that in one of the cited examples from the Senate floor fight on Thursday was Selena Sowell. So she um, is one of the people who is suing mm -hmm. with uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a designated hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. So she is one of the people that is uh, suing because she claims that she lost out on academic opportunities. She is in college with an academic scholarship. She did not lose out on opportunities. Transgender athletes are not coming in and taking academic scholarships from people. Um, they are not causing harm to their peers in any way, shape or form. So that's one of the misconceptions, right? Um, that didn't happen, that is factually incorrect. Uh, another thing that's happening, um, I forgot Chelsea's last name, but she's the one of the athletes in Connecticut who is suing um, because of Andrea and Terry Miller participating in sports. So there's this idea that um, transgender athletes beat their um, non-transgender peers every single time. If you look at the history of these three girls participating in Connecticut track and field, they go back and forth um, with who wins what race when they win the races. Chelsea, the non-transgender athlete, ultimately won the state meet and also is moving on to participate in sports with academic scholarships. So this is, again, this is just not a problem. It's just not anywhere in the country, but especially not in Texas. What we saw happen actually, and we're working with a client who's in this exact same situation as well now, is we see that there are transgender boys who are forced to compete in um, girls' sports. You can look up the story of Mac Beggs, um, another very young, sweet boy from Corpus Christi with his thick Texas accent, Charlie Apple. I love him. <laughs> the sweetest boy. Um, he shared his story about how he had done martial arts his whole life. And when he got to high school, he started to um, he started to come out as transgender, do the social transition, uh, figuring out where he was. And he was forced to compete on the 
girls wrestling team. You know, this reminds me a lot of the whole bathroom bill that we went through too, where the, you know, they make all this smoke and screen about what is really happening and the people really getting hurt are the transgender youth. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are actually um, hurting from all these rules of yeah. the trend. Yeah, one of the senators on the floor when they were doing this Senate fight on, um, I think it, the first time they were doing it was actually on Wednesday. Um, he made a point, if we were really concerned about safety in sports, we would stop football altogether. Right. If we were really concerned about like the injuries that happened, we would stop football together. Notably, according to the UIL policy currently, girls are allowed to participate in boys football. And um, actually when I was in eighth grade, we forced them to let girls play on the boys flag football team. And it was a Catholic school and they did. They did let girls participate mm -hmm. in the flag football um, team in eighth grade. I just, it's so funny to me to think back on how we did that in eighth grade and like where we are today. Uh, right? yeah. How old was I, 14 years? That was half of my life ago. And yeah. nobody complained about the girls getting hurt then. And at the time we were like, um, it's one, it's flag football, two, like you have to let us play <laughs> according to this policy. Yeah, yeah, it's so unfortunate. All the time we're wasting with these ridiculous spills. These are, yeah, these are fake attacks that are not rooted in any sort of science. Um, they, they are, they contradict themselves. When I say they, I mean the, the far right and the, the multiple attacks that they're waging against the transgender community right now, they contradict themselves with their attacks. They simultaneously say that they don't want trans people playing sports because of an advantage that they might have because of their hormones. And then on the other side, they want to, um, they want to bar transgender kids and teens from ever accessing the care that they need to be able to to be on their own gender journey without facing the irreversible harm that sometimes that going through a puberty that you do not want to go through can cause, right? Yeah. Um, even though puberty suppressors have been used for years on kids who enter puberty too soon. So I think it it, it is completely accurate to say that uh, these laws that they're trying to pass, they're just anti-trans. There is no protecting anybody. There is no, no legal reason, no medical reason. They are simply anti-trans. It's protecting girls and women. It's the same messaging that they used when they were saying that we couldn't have trans people in bathrooms that aligned with their gender. Um, it is a message that some people are particularly sympathetic to, and so it's easy to to use it as a, as a way to get your hate full message across. Wow. All right. Well, since with SB 29, um, having passed the Senate floor on Thursday, what does that, what does that really mean? And what are the next step? What happens from here? So on Thursday, SB 29 was read on the Senate floor for the third time, which means that it passed to engrossment. I hate that I'm using these words. I, <laughs> I do this all day now. Um, yeah, so it means it passed the, the Senate chamber and is now going to be waiting. Normally, what happens is once uh, a bill passes a Senate committee, it goes to the Senate floor. And then from the Senate floor, once it passes there, it goes over to the House. Um, to be heard in the committee in the house over there. What happened in the case of SB 29 is that it has a companion bill. And so it already has the same identical bill on the house side in committee. And that bill is gonna be heard next Tuesday at eight in the morning, central standard time. So seven in the morning, El Paso time. Um, the house committee on public education where Mary Gonzalez is the vice chair will hear uh, HB 4042 which is the next bill to be watching. Um, so that committee is going to be hearing that bill. And if it passes out of the committee there, it goes to the House. It goes to the full House floor to be voted on three times. And um, from there, it doesn't have to go over to the Senate side because the Senate bill already passed. And the two bills essentially meet in the middle. Um, if there's any major differences between them, they can get sorted out. and. Um, then they have they have to go back 
to, if there's major differences in the House bill, they have to go back actually. Um, but right now they're identical. It's likely that they'll remain identical. And from there, they would probably just go to the governor's desk to be signed. And, and let me ask you at this point. We're not there yet. Okay, we're not there yet. And even though this is very unlikely, does, would the governor have the power at that point to veto the bill if it was a different human being altogether? He would have the power to veto the bill, yes. Okay. So right now, there's, it still needs to be heard in, this, in the House. Um, so that's, and that's going to happen next week. That's going to happen next Tuesday. It still has to be heard in House committee. Committee so first. First, first committee. And then to the floor. But if it passes out of the committee, they can hear the bill. They can um, hear the arguments and they can choose to not vote on it. And it can stay in committee and it can die in committee. And this is the committee you said Mary Gonzalez is? Yes, she's on the committee. She's on the committee, okay. All right, and for those of you who don't know, Mary Gonzalez is uh, from class. I'm sorry? Is that your rep in Socorro? <laughs> um, no, not where I live. Oh. Not, not exactly where my address is, but yes. Yeah, it's from, so. From here and an ally. Um, and part course. of the community, but certainly like a, a trans ally, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. A part of our community and an ally fighting for our rights up there and um, at our capital. Yeah. Thank goodness. Thank goodness for her. And what are some other bills that we all need to be looking out for or be aware of? Um, some of the major bills that, that moved this week are the first one that was up on Monday where Melody was there and testifying against it. She gave a beautiful testimony against it. Um, that was SB 1646, which attempts to criminalize parents um, for child abuse if they support their child through gender affirming care. So that's a particularly horrendous bill. It hasn't passed out of the Senate committee. It was heard in Senate committee on Monday, but it hasn't been passed out of Senate state affairs. Um, that one also has a House Companion Bill. That House Companion Bill has also not been scheduled for a public hearing. So that's, we can breathe easy. So that's um, good news, that's good, okay, good. That's good news for now. Um, the other bill that did move out of committee uh, was HB 1399. That bill had a public hearing on Wednesday. Um, the public hearing went until midnight. Um, there was a lot of good testimony there was a doctor who spoke for about 40 minutes at the end of it about the facts of gender affirming care for kids and teens um, and what that looks like right at every stage. That bill, um, normally what they do is they hear a bill one week and then they come back the next week to vote them out. That bill ended up being voted out the next day. So Thursday, evening at 6 p.m. Public Health Committee met in secret and not live streamed. And um, though they had released the, the list of bills to members that they were going to vote on that day, it, HB 1399 was not on that list and they added it on and voted it out. So that is um, HP 1399 is the one that would is a ban on medical care effectively for gender, for anybody who provides gender affirming care. Um, any healthcare provider would be barred from providing gender affirming care. They would be barred from providing um, what, puberty blocking hormones. They would be barred from any surgeries that don't already happen. So completely unnecessary part of the bill. The only surgeries that sometimes happen on minors um, are people under the age of 18 are when trans boys um, are seeking to have a mastectomy. And again, none of this happens without parental consent. None of this happens without consulting a medical provider. And all of this is best practice medical care. Uh, if a cisgender boy went started going through puberty and started developing breasts, he could easily go to a doctor and request to have a mastectomy and nobody would question it. There have been barriers in care for transgender adults for my entire life, certainly, but they exist for for everybody, right? And I mean, in the case of teens, it is a decision that is made with the parents, the child and their doctor, right? So this is a, a bill that would 
essentially ban that care. And it would also uh, prohibit doctors from getting liability insurance if they provide that care. So, so this is essentially the government taking away the parental right to take care of your children, to provide the care that your children need. Yes, yeah. Well, they're, they're taking away the medicals, the physicians. Medical the yeah. yeah, it is similar to the Arkansas bill. But I want to say that it is, it just passed out of House Committee. Um, what we can do on that bill is we can stop it from ever reaching the House floor by placing a lot of pressure on Dade Phelan. Uh, he is the Speaker of the House. He is the one who has some control over whether or not bills go to the floor, as does Calendars Committee. And wow. Joe Moody from El Paso is on, calendars is on the Calendars Committee, so we can also apply pressure there and make sure that he knows that we're watching and that we don't want this bill to move. So call Joe Moody, call Dave Phelan, tell them you don't want this bill to move because it would cause and has already caused in some ways irreparable harm. And I know that, and it is, I am so sorry. Yeah. And that, well, that was gonna be my next question. And, and I think because I know many times um, before I started, you know, doing the work that I do, I also felt helpless and hopeless, you know, in certain situations, wondering what can I do? How can I make a difference? I'm just this little person, this little brown woman, right? What can I do to make a difference? So for people out there who are feeling like their hands have been tied behind their backs, what can they do to end these bills? For people who have been feeling like their hands are tied behind their backs, um, you can sign up at techtxtranskids.org um, to get involved in the legislature. We, that, that would put you on a list uh, to get updates from the ACLU, to get updates from Equality Texas, to get updates from uh, Texas, the Trans Education Network of Texas, uh, Lambda Legal, who else is, yeah, we work with all of our partners on this website. So you would, you would get plugged into all of those email lists um, immediately to get those updates on how you can get involved. Equality Texas is doing phone banking. If you want to do phone banking, please reach out to me. I can send you the information, Lorena. In okay. fact, I'll make you part of that network that where I'm sharing that information out. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The phone banks are to target Dade Phelan, as I said, to not let these bills go to the floor. Sometimes these phone banks are to target specific members on the House Public Education Committee to, so we call, we do a phone bank, right? We call people that live in their district and we ask them to reach out to their representatives um, because it is much more effective to, to hear from your own constituents, right? That they oppose these bills. So that's what, that's what we're doing. Um, spreading the word, I just, all of this legislature stuff aside, right? Like we are more than this as a community. We are more than these like legislative attacks on our humanity. There are 18 months out of the year that we don't have to deal with this body of people trying to take away our rights. And it is important just as always to use that time to, to be your most authentic self, to encourage others to be their most authentic selves, to support and love and provide for each other what this state has proved to us that it will not. And, and building up strength in our community, strength and resilience in our own community um, and in sharing our stories and supporting each other, I think is the most that we can do. I just, it's really important to remember that we are more than this and no matter what they do, we will keep fighting back and we have to not let it consume us because they're not worthy of that and they're not worthy of our lives and they can never take our joy from us. That was beautiful and that was, that was an important message. I think uh, people, we need to not forget that. And you know, just to follow up on, on what you've talked on right now, uh, for those of you who are, who do feel a little overwhelmed when we're talking legislation and politics, um, just so you know, there are toolkits. And what I mean by toolkits is when you go to these websites, all these different organizations have created uh, scripts that you can read off from when you make that phone call, if you've never made a phone call like that before. There are letters and petitions that you just have to sign your name onto, and that makes you part of the fight. So please don't feel like um, you're gonna go into this space without support. There are, they already have the tools in place 
so that you, to uplift your voice so that your voice is heard. And like Adri was saying, we can live our most authentic lives, be our, our most authentic selves. And as allies, what you do is you make the space for people to be able to do that, to be their most authentic selves. Um, stand up with us. We are a small community. Uh, we need everybody who loves us to stand up with us. So Adri, I've known you for a while. <laughs> We've met right in different circles and uh, taken on different uh, types of fights together. But what I wanna know is it's been four and a half years since you've been fighting for trans rights and you faced a lot of what probably feels like never ending challenges. And I know that you've had to defend your right to just exist in the world as who you are, as Adri. So what would you say to trans kids who right now might be feeling that same pressure and might be feeling that, especially during these times, right? When it's all over social media, the attack on who they are, what would you say to them as far as uh, feelings of hopelessness or helplessness? I mean, I would just start by saying that I, I completely understand what it's like to be in that space. I have been there before. I have felt very hopeless when I was not able to ask, access gender affirming care. And that's why HB 1399 passing in particular is, is so hard. Because I know what it was like to feel like there was there was never gonna like things were never gonna get better. Um, but I think it's really important to point out that I am here seven years later, or like nine years later after coming out, and things did get better, um, and things have gotten better since 2017. We have made progress in that building. There are people there who did not know how to talk about transgender rights before that know how to do it now. And that is small, but it is a little bit of progress. And they are they are standing there in the Senate and on the floor of the house and they're standing up for, for trans people and for trans rights and they're pushing back on the narratives that the far right conservatives are trying to push. Um, I would also go ahead and say that um, we're gonna keep fighting. I this bill is unconstitutional, blatantly point blank on its face. <laughs> like you cannot allow one group of people to receive treatment and then deny it to another group of people. That is that is blatant commute that is blatant discrimination. Um, and so we're gonna keep fighting on these bills. The ACLU is getting ready to sue in Arkansas, and if Texas passes the bill, we will also sue here. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and you all are not alone. Um, we're doing this together. Um, we are a community. Uh, we're here for you if you need us. We're gonna have our uh, next PFLAG support group meeting on the 22nd, Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, our event is out there on Facebook. You all are welcome to come. If you're watching this for the first time and you're thinking, well, what can I do from here? come to this meeting, have the conversation with us. It's a safe space. If you have questions, if you're a child or you have a loved one who has come out as transgender and you're not sure what to do with this information or how to support them, come without judgment. We will meet you where you are and uh, we'll have these conversations with you. If you are having um, difficulties with the school your child is attending, if they are discriminated against your child, come talk to us, we'll put you in contact with the right people. We have the ACLU, uh, Trala, and a whole lot of other organizations that will help us. So Adri, thank you for your time and this conversation. Um, you all, if you all have any questions, reach out, let us know and we'll get in touch with you. Thank you so much, Jordana. Um, yes. For closing on that note. And again, just to all the trans people, we see you, you are valid. You are loved and you are not alone. There are so many people who are so smart and so dedicated and committed to this work that are fighting against these bills right now. And I am honored to be among them. Um, but I just think it's really important to know that there are people going full force trying to fight against these bills and we're gonna do our best to stop them. We need your help too, if you're willing to, to pitch in and be part of the fight. 
because everybody's helped, definitely, pitch in, community and allies alike. Yeah. Right. Thank you.